Hello again. Today we are going to talk about chronic fatigue syndrome, understanding trauma, fear, and stress as they relate to chronic fatigue syndrome. And uh, I'm Dr. Martin Rutherford. I am a certified functional medicine practitioner here in the state of Nevada at the windy, rainy, snowy foothills of the Sierras right at this moment. Dr. Randall Gates, board certified chiropractic neurologist, also a chiropractor. Yeah, so today we're gonna to talk about chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, you know, and, and, and we're gonna talk about, mainly we're gonna talk about stress, but, I'd, but, but we're gonna talk about a unique aspect of stress. When people come to our office to be evaluated, uh, the patient goes through kind of a screening process. They get to be, they get to be examined, and um, and we even do a kind of a little extended exam, which we will treat their neurological findings to determine whether that will respond to what we're doing. Um, one of the big issues that we see across the board is stress, but particularly with the chronic fatigue syndrome patient we see a certain clinical presentation that generally will include um, thyroid problems that have been misdiagnosed, they're not taken care of, or blood sugar problems. We might see gut problems, we might see Epstein-Barr virus, we might see anemias, but we always see this stress problem. And in the initial interview, if I can pick up on that, then I will try to explain it to the patient and that what we're talking about is not what you have been educated is stress. In other words, a lot of people will sit in front of me and say, well, I'm not stressed because a lot of people just don't like to admit they're stressed. Others go, yeah, I'm stressed out of my mind. Um, but what we're going to be talking about today really is the type of stress where the patient sits there and goes, why am I feeling so stressed? I mean, I don't feel like my, even your life may be good, even though you're not feeling a lot of energy. Maybe you got a good relationship, a good job, your kids are great, maybe life is good and, and, and you're not feeling well and they're all kind of in your boat and they're all supporting you, but you still feel stressed or anxiety and you wanna know why that is. Or you, and, and so you get these, you get insomnia, you get all these different types of things. And there are terms for that that Dr. Gates and, and I are probably going to discuss, probably more Dr. Gates than myself. Um, we call them sympathetic dominance. We call them sympathetic wind-up. You might be more familiar with the term called fight-flight. But these are not terms that communicate well to people in the lay public because we have just used the term stress. So we're going to, going to delineate those two because if you have chronic fatigue syndrome, you probably have the mechanisms that we're going to talk about relative to creating a lot of stress hormones in your system on a fairly consistent basis. And they do a lot of bad things that damage the parts of your cells and your nervous system that create energy. Okay. So I don't know. Does that make sense? It makes sense. Was that good? Okay. That's I'm good. trying to lay it out there. So right up front so that you kind of know what we're, what we're going to be talking about. We'll be talking about an overview of chronic fatigue syndrome, which is which we see in here regularly. Um, we're gonna talk about the HPA axis, which means your hippo, yeah, your hippocampus. I've been talking about hippocampuses. So your hypothalamus, which is the part of your brain that detects a lot of things and sends out a lot of signals, your pituitary, and the infamous and well-known adrenals. Mm -hmm. And I've written a couple of articles on why the adrenals are the wrong target for many of you who've gone to alternative practitioners. I guess we're kind of put more in that alternative group, although we don't feel that way. But um, so we're going to clear that up today uh, because this is more than taking an adrenal supplement. Uh, and, and then we'll talk about the new research that kind of backs us up on everything that we're talking about. So an overview of chronic fatigue syndrome, I just kind of gave a mini, mini, mm -hmm. mini, mini, mm -hmm. mini, mini that's overview good. of chronic fatigue syndrome. Mm -hmm. I think that's excellent. And what I'll just add in is that a lot of chronic fatigue patients and maybe it's promoted by the practitioners are seeing have a singular focus as to the cause of their chronic fatigue. By that I mean, we see a lot of chronic fatigue patients that come in and say, 
oh, it's my Lyme disease. That's what's causing my chronic fatigue. Or no, it's Epstein-Barr virus. Or no, it's my thyroid. Or no, it's my adrenals. Or no, it's my gut. <clears throat> and in today's society, everybody is trying to market to you that you know their their one thing is the cause. And I yeah. you alluded to this, but I just want to hammer it home because chronic fatigue is just not that way, people. Chronic fatigue is a multifaceted conglomeration of different aspects of physiology that have broken down. Today we're talking about stress, but we've treated chronic fatigue patients where we just fix their gut. I don't want to say chest, but that was the first stage of our program. They've had it for 35 years and their chronic fatigue goes away. But there are so many chronic fatigue patients who will change their diet and they don't feel better. And so they give up because they're frustrated saying, well, that didn't work. Well, it's more complicated than that. Yeah. And for the record, we have a pretty good grip on chronic fatigue. And I'm not saying that because, you know, oh, we're great or anything. I mean, we've done a lot of, but chronic fatigue started here in Northern Nevada. It started really about 30 miles from here in Incline Village. Mm -hmm. Dr. Dan Peterson. Peterson was the first one to be astute enough to realize that Epstein-Barr virus had something to do with chronic fatigue. But, but Dr. Peterson's uh, uh, position was Epstein-Barr virus was chronic fatigue. Mm -hmm. I know, and I know just from having patients, a few patients in common with him, uh, and taking their histories that he is changing towards this model. Now, I haven't talked to him. I have talked to him in the past. I haven't talked to him now. So we were saying chronic fatigue, CFITS is what it was referred to back in the 90s. And they, but they were chronic fatigue fibromyalgia patients. Mm -hmm. they, were, they had pain all over. So we've had the opportunity to track chronic fatigue from Epstein-Barr virus forward. In fact, most of the people who have chronic fatigue from Epstein-Barr virus actually have it because it's affected their thyroid and they have Hashimoto's, so they might have both and mm -hmm. things of that nature. So we're probably gonna talk a little bit about that, but we're gonna talk mostly about the, the fight flight syndrome that is, seems to be there in, in virtually, I, I, and if I'm exaggerating, please correct me, in virtually every chronic fatigue patient that's ever walked through this door. I can't say everyone. You just, but you just said you fixed the stomach and, and right, the intestines yeah, yeah. Right. and it got better. So I would say the vast majority of patients have this. Um, I don't, I, I won't put a percentage on it. It is just, um, it's just, it, it's, it's huge as far as the numbers of patients who come in who have this aspect of the things we talked about, thyroid, blood sugar, um, gut, Epstein-Barr, anemia, and stress hormones. And even though that's, seven things i think it was six actually <laughs> even though six or seven things um this seems to show up as regularly or more regularly than anything mm -hmm. and i just want to take what you said and go a little more in detail please, so please. in that overview and the way we evaluate chronic fatigue patients we mentioned this in other broadcasts but let's just go through it quickly we first look at intestinal bacteria what has been shown is that pieces of those bacteria can diffuse into your bloodstream at too high of a rate this is the whole leaky gut phenomena and that can be associated with chronic fatigue. If you're ever into reading the literature, you have to be able to discern who's using the right tests for telling if somebody has leaky gut syndrome or not, because now it's a well-acknowledged phenomena and we use a gold standard test to really determine if that's present or not. And there are just some other knockoff tests. So I wanna interject that. Next thing you have to look at is autoimmunity to the thyroid, like Dr. Rutherford mentioned. So a large proportion of our chronic fatigue patients that we see have immune attacks on their thyroid you also need to be abreast on the information that the high value for the immune count to the thyroid is not widely agreed upon. For example, the high value is set forth by the Mayo Clinic and the local hospitals here in Reno, both of them use basically 8.9 or 9 as the high value. But lab course is 34 and some labs are still saying 50. So if you're in that gray range, they're going to tell you that you're normal, but maybe you're not normal. Yeah. So if you're a 9 to 50, they might tell you that you're normal, but you're not. Exactly. And especially if you've just had your thyroid hormones checked and those are normal, but lots of times the immune counts to the thyroid have not been run. Also, you have to evaluate, like Dr. Rutherford said, the Epstein-Barr virus association. There's a huge association between Epstein-Barr and other viruses actually that live in the thyroid that can be a part and parcel of the immune attack on the thyroid. Chronic intracellular infections, including Epstein-Barr, can derange the mitochondria that help to make energy. We also see that there can just be generalized inflammation associated with Epstein-Barr, or excuse me, with chronic fatigue syndrome. And then also things like iron deficiency anemias have to be assessed in addition to brain firing patterns. 
So for any patient who has quote unquote chronic fatigue, you do have to rule out depression. Now we did a broadcast comparing and contrasting depression versus chronic fatigue syndrome. You may want to watch that. A lot of patients are so reticent to say, I'm not depressed, I'm not depressed, I'm not depressed. But in actuality, some people with chronic fatigue syndrome are depressed. Whereas in actuality, there are a lot of people who've been diagnosed with depression and they actually have chronic fatigue syndrome. Because if you go into a general practitioner and you say, I have fatigue, the first thing they're thinking after they roll out a heart-related cause is you're that you're depressed. depressed. So that's kind of the skinny on the whole issue. And today we're really going to talk about an area of brain physiology that involves depression, but it can be separate from depression too, yeah. and seen with chronic fatigue patients. And as Dr. Rutherford illuminated, it's this area called the hypothalamus, the pituitary, which is the master hormone gland in your body, and the connection between that to the adrenal glands. What they've shown is that in chronic fatigue patients is that the signaling between this pituitary and the adrenal gland, or adrenal glands, is low in chronic fatigue patients. And so a lot of people just said, okay, well, that's present, and that's probably why they're so fatigued, because it's a stress-based response. But as we've gone farther into the literature now, more and more research is coming out, we're seeing some really exciting things and things that Dr. Rutherford and I have seen and speculated upon, but are now being shown to be absolutely true. First, I'll start with the fact that they did a study with adolescent chronic fatigue patients, and they saw, yes, they have low cortisol, but surprisingly, few studies had ever looked at concentrations of adrenaline. So think of epinephrine and norepinephrine, technically, if you want those terms, but think adrenaline. And a lot of patients who have chronic fatigue report being wired and tired, but you look at their cortisol assays and their cortisol is just bottom of the barrel all day long. And you beg the question, well, how is that even possible? Well, within the world of the adrenal gland, you may wanna go watch our broadcast on this too, because within endocrinology, they really don't acknowledge adrenal, uh, you know, adrenal problems from a functional perspective. So adrenal fatigue, they don't acknowledge its, its existence. So unless you have an autoimmune attack on your adrenal gland, they're going to say your adrenals are completely fine. But there's a lot of research to basically go against that notion. And so with these adrenal glands, they can become functionally low. And part of what we're thinking is happening is that in the chronic fatigue patients, their adrenal glands become fatigued to make cortisol, but it's a different type of tissue in the adrenal gland. It's actually neurological tissue that makes adrenaline, which does not fatigue. So you may have been exposed to childhood trauma or some form of stress earlier in life, which is so commonly associated with chronic fatigue syndrome, including emotional neglect. And then that set you up to be kind of in a stressful state. If you want to think of it, you may not have been perceive that you're under stress, but you're kind of, you're sitting at 30% higher than everybody else in terms of your stress responses your whole life. And in doing so, your adrenal glands burn out. And then as a result, your adrenaline can still stay high and create a lot of the negative effects on physiology. And I want to go back and I want to go back and emphasize that because this is usually a big aha for the patient when I'm doing their mm -hmm. consult. And we have we we first go into stress, and then sometimes people just go, yeah. And and I and I'm going like, well, well, I might not be talking about the stress that you're talking about. And other people just go, no, I'm, I handle it just fine. No, I'm fine. And I mean, I get that. That's probably a a, a better survival mechanism than collapsing. Uh, but this fear mechanism, I, I think, would be appropriate to to make it a little bit clearer in a sense of. of um, most people are very surprised. I will, when I'm interviewing people, I will usually look down and I'll say, there's a fear center in your brain that will set this whole mechanism off and keep it going intermittently, 24 hours a day. And it's just flooding your system with stress hormones, particularly the ones that Dr. Gates was talking about. And I'll usually look down and say, usually there's sexual, there's physical, there's verbal abuse, or maybe you had abandonment issues, or maybe you've been in a knockdown drag out divorce. And I'll put my head down, but I can see the patient going like this, like shaking their head like this. And it's almost a relief to the patient. Mm -hmm. and, and, and usually then I can share with them. And if, you ha if you're experiencing this, you're experiencing, you're probably experiencing insomnia. A lot of people don't connect it to their mm -hmm. stress. They're, you're probably experiencing insomnia. You may be experiencing, but, but the thing that people really experience, they'll say, you know, it, it, 
I, you're right. I don't really feel like I should be stressed. I, it's just like, I just get stressed for no reason at all. I get anxiety for no reason at all, or I can't sleep and I'm, and I'm laying there wondering why. And that seems to be more of the, of, of the practicality of, of what you will experience. But, but, and, and you might want to share that a little bit with a little bit to me, what I, what I think would give a little bit more clarity is they've done studies on this oh, yeah. and they've shown that the fear center actually lights up when they interview these folks and what are they doing pet scans on them or something like that or? Well, a lot of the research like with insomnia what they found is that if you have insomnia your fear center is lighting up before bed if they do brain scans versus people who do not have insomnia anxiety as an example is actually not correlated with insomnia but what is correlated is basically the fear center just lighting up so you don't have to be anxious to have insomnia which is an important so technically Technically, it, it, there's this emotional thing with people going like, well, no, I'm, I'm not stressed. I'm not, a lot, and some aren't. Mm -hmm. but, but it seems to help people to feel a little bit better to understand that there's this mechanism that they have had no control over that just kind of going cra crazy mm -hmm. uh, on them. And, and it's not really them. Because that seems to be one more worry that perpetuates their stress mm -hmm. cycle of like, okay, I'm stressed. Why am I stressed? Why can't I handle it? Am I weak? Do I need to go see a psychologist? Do I need to do this? And the answer is probably not, not that counseling is not good. We're, we're, we're big advocates of counseling when this thing really gets out of control. But, but for them realize, for you to realize this is a clinical part, a physiological, biochemical, neurological condition that's occurring that can be addressed or try to address it with drugs. They try to address it with herbs and botanicals, but most of those people have tried that by the time they get here mm -hmm. and, it, and it's not working. The right. Xanax and the Prozacs mm -hmm. and the, and the adaptocrines and the adrenal stuff and all that type of stuff. Yeah. Cause so often everybody is just throwing darts at the dartboard and yeah, you may be taking and Xanax. And then gone to psychologists and right, stuff. You're, you're not saying, not, not, There's, not saying don't go to psychiatrists right. or psychologists. We're just saying, there's just a this very more specific that. order that has to be dealt with, with handling a chronic fatigue patient. You have to assess all those variables I alluded to 10 minutes ago. Those all have to be accounted for in an organized fashion, our experience, for a chronic fatigue patient to feel better. Especially those chronic fatigue patients who are taking Prozac and they don't feel better. The chronic fatigue patient who's been in counseling and is taking adrenal supplements, has been treated for Lyme disease and they're still not feeling better. Well, there are definite reasons why. And going a little bit further, what they're finding is that your immune cells actually become insensitive to stress hormones when you have chronic fatigue syndrome, which is highly interesting because we're seeing these inflammatory responses of the immune system that are out of proportion to what your body is receiving in terms of pathogens. So that's intriguing, which is part of the reason why a lot of people still have autoimmune responses, even though you're on the paleo diet, as an example. And then we also see that perfectionism is very high in the chronic fatigue patient population. And so that perfectionism can actually be a negative factor. And they're seeing that it associates with the cortisol being low. So the more of a perfectionist you are, the more low your cortisol is if you have chronic fatigue syndrome. So that's been mapped out now. Also, we've seen that a lot with our chronic fatigue patients and mm -hmm. their focus sometimes on their illness and why they can't feel better and just aspects of their daily life. They try to be perfect perfect, perfect. And it's maybe you know, got to get straight A's. Yeah. Got to get that. Got to yeah. get that uh, be job. The best at my job. Have yeah. to do the, you know, those types of things. It's very, very common. It's always, especially in the kids that come in and have it. Mm -hmm. they're, if they're like in high school or, or college, you can almost guarantee that they're, that right. they're high functioning, intelligent kids who are, who will like, you know, go into a depression if they get an A minus on, on one of their subjects. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. And that leads to their adrenal glands eventually burning out. That's basically what happened. And there are some other speculations, you know, is the immune inflammation causing the brain not to send the right signals? Is it a depression like gray area that's crossing over into chronic fatigue? You can speculate on that all you want, but just know this is what the literature is showing. And it's very, very powerful for the chronic fatigue patient to know this, like you said, to kind of have that epiphany of yeah, you know, that trauma I had in childhood could be relating to my symptoms now. My perfectionist lifestyle is probably not helping me. Maybe I need to get help for that as well if everything else is not working. And just know, consider all these factors and everything else we, we told you in that general outline of chronic fatigue.
So that pretty well summarizes well, and I, and what I, I think, wanted to okay. bring to today's broadcast. What else? I was just going to say to me, again, to bring a little bit of clinical practicality to it. To me, when, I, when I'm doing evaluations, that's a big part of what I'm evaluating relative mm -hmm. to other patients. Really a good candidate to do it. And the, and the, and the, more, the more severe that is it's almost becomes like a post-traumatic stress syndrome mm -hmm. in the most in the more severe cases and and to me that uh is probably and yeah and dr gates is doing all the treatment now so I, I defer to him on this that seems to me to be the key or the most challenging factor to get through in these types of cases when it's there is that would that be correct? it is because we develop a personality so to speak and it's pretty hard to change your personality almost in total, when that personality may produce very successful outcomes in some areas of life, but then it's basically ruining your physiology. So finding that balance in a personality of not being a perfectionist per se is very difficult for a lot of patients. And it, it basically requires an intense focus and commitment to wanting to at least make some positive changes in that. And it does. And the last thing I wanted to say was, I wanted to really bring this out because because we receive a lot of patients from a lot of, shall we say, the most qualified medical facilities in the country, but also some of the more qualified alternative practitioners who have done the thyroid, who have given adrenal supplements, mm -hmm. who have done well with the stomach, but just can't seem to get over the case. And my observation through exams and through the histories and, and, and through the initial consults is this seems to be the key factor in those cases that a, a lot of times this mechanism requires a more direct response. Now, Dr. Gates is a board certified functional neurologist, chiropractic neurologist. I don't know what they're calling it today because it's not just chiropractors who take these courses, but, mm -hmm. but um, it's one of the reasons that we melded functional medicine and, and chiropractic neurology together because it seems like the chiropractic neurologists were the first ones, first ones I ever heard talking about the overfiring intermediate lateral nucleus, which is the part of the spine that transfers this down to your this signal down to your adrenals, and uh, and it just seems like it's the definitive factor in taking care of migraines and dizziness and vertigo. If it's there, if it's there, it just seemed like it was the delineating factor, and that's where the others seem to fail. And then my other observation is, like I just got done saying. A lot of these people are coming in already two or three anti-anxiety medications, antidepressants, anti-stress medications. Mm -hmm. They've been all, all the supplements and yet it's still not getting better. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the semi, and people are always saying, what's the solution? And we always have to say, these are complex cases that usually involve multiple vicious cycles that have to be kind of peeled down in order. Well, this, if this vicious cycle is there, to me, it's almost like the key now, again, mm -hmm. Don Gates is, is, is a treater. He might think differently, but to me, that is the key. And so and when a person comes in and that's not been happening, they'll say, well, how are you going to take care of it? And that's where the brain rehab work combined with taking care of the thyroid and the blood sugar and the anemia and the, primarily the gut. I mean, Dr. Gates indicated we go with the gut first and, and that's correct. Um, that's where that combined effort and actually going in and, and being able to kind of reset that midbrain fear center and then strengthen the other areas of the brain that are supposed to be putting the brakes on that, that's where that really is. What I have seen, and, I, and I'm not saying this from a prejudice, I'm gonna say because we do it, because we've tried everything. That's what I've seen be, and maybe a combination of both be the best, well, not maybe, definitely a combination of both taking care of the physiology and, and, and kind of resynchronizing brain function with these brain rehab exercises uh, and brain strengthening exercises and midbrain dampening procedures seems to be the most effective tools that we have found. And, and, and we're getting pretty consistently successful results right now in improperly selected patients. And those of you who've watched us and have heard us say properly selected patients there's a, a, a there's 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 a handful of things that go with that. Who, who who would be the type of patient who could do these types of protocols? We have signs around here that say we 
all the signs say we didn't say it was going to be easy. We said it would be it's going to be worth it. But this to me seems to be the other mm -hmm. factor. When I see somebody who's on the high end scale of having this um, this trauma fear type stress that literally is programmed into their amygdala, their fear center. That's when my that's when my my kind of like awareness goes up and goes, is this going to be a person that's going to be able to get through this? Are they like a 10 mm -hmm. or are they like a five or an eight? And if they're a 10, are we going to have to call other people in to help with counseling while you're doing your magic and, and while they're changing their gut and all that type of stuff? And I'm just trying to give a little bit more practicality to the complexities and understandings of your case because I mean, you know, I, I look on the internet and everything is presented as, oh, take this for that and oh, take that for this, like you started out in the beginning. Man, this is not like that. And and so it's a challenge to, to even make sure that we are accepting the patients who have the potential to get through this. Mm -hmm. And some people in the end may need to take medication and seek psychiatrist. You know, I mean, if you're really severe, if you're the Gulf War veteran who's seen all kinds of horrible, terrible things, and we've had a couple in that category, they're more challenging cases than the person who just has nightmares and can't sleep and gets night sweats and, and just doesn't know why they're fearful. There's definitely a, uh, a, a spectrum from zero to 10 mm -hmm. of, of how se severe is this fight flight mechanism. So I, I, I just wanna get that in there. I don't know, I, I hope that was helpful to those of you who are really looking for some hard data and, we're, and it's hard to say we can't tell you what to do here because you have to evaluate the person you have to get their history you have to know where they are on that scale do they have a gut problem do they have thyroid blood sugar adrenals gut but if this adrenal thing if this stress thing is there to me it trumps everything even the gut that we talk about like ad yeah, nauseum absolutely. <laughs> absolutely yeah it does is that yeah i mean i think so right. i think the brain is where it's at in these things and, and, and that's the hard thing. All the things that we mentioned alter brain function. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, nothing probably more than stress hormones, though. So, I mean, it really does. If you're fatigued, your brain's under attack. And, and this trauma and fear mechanism, I mean, to me, as, a, as an outsider in the functional neurology world, but doing all the interviews, it's like, man, when I hear that, that's when my awareness goes up of like, okay, should we should we recommend treatment to this patient? Because right. that's usually the deal breaker mm -hmm. if, if we can get the patient through that or not. So it's not you, it's not you. It's, it's your HPA axis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, mm -hmm. it's, tr it's past trauma, it's past fear. It's, it's the things that we mentioned before. Yeah. I don't know if that went farther than you wanted to go. No, that's, just... that's exactly it. Okay, yeah. cool. Okay, so you can access the research articles we attached to today's broadcast on powerhealthtalk.com. All you got to do is search chronic fatigue and today's broadcast will come up and you'll see the research articles at the bottom of the broadcast. All of our other broadcasts have research articles attached there as well. And if you have any comments, you can give those to us at powerhealthtalk.com. And otherwise, we will see you next week for another exciting broadcast.